In this video, I'm going to detail a complete calisthenics push-pull program for maximizing strength performance. You can implement this program yourself, even if you're a calisthenics beginner, to see rapid progress. And the program does leave some space for other types of training, so it can be enhanced further on if you want to. But more about that later on. I got you, homie. Now in this video, I'm going to cover three things. First and foremost, the exercises we'll be using to take our push and pull strength to the next level. Number two, one of the most reliable progression systems for steady strength gains. And number three, I'm going to go over how to combine and program everything from set and rep ranges to rest times and deload weeks so you can avoid plateaus, but ensure that the program is sustainable so you can keep on becoming stronger in the long run. If you truly want to skyrocket your progress, click the top link in the description down below and join our brotherhood of passionate athletes that all want to take their strength to new levels and unlock awesome skills as well. In the community, we have live calls, courses, monthly challenges and more, so join now whilst you still have the chance. Click the top link in the description down below and I'll see you inside. Cheers. All right, so let's get into the full calisthenics push and pull strength program. Now, to begin, we want to cover some prerequisites and this is especially important for you that haven't added weight to your pull-ups or to your dips before. So on the pushing side of things, you want to be able to do at least 10 and at least 10 dips and 15 push-ups. And this is with good technique. It's really important as we're starting to load exercises that you're doing things with correct technique, because otherwise you'll be building incorrect movement patterns, you'll be running into injuries and just all kinds of nonsense, things that we absolutely don't want to occur in our training at all. So make sure that you're able to do 10 plus dips and 15 plus pull-ups with good technique, push-ups, sorry, with good technique. If you're not able to do so, go back and work on the basics. Similarly, similarly on the pulling side of things, we want to do minimum six to eight clean, good technique bodyweight pull-ups before we jump into this program. I'd recommend honestly close to being able to do 10 plus bodyweight pull-ups, again, with, with clean technique. If you're not there yet, I've got a video on how to scale your pull-up reps. There's somewhere on screen right now on a card. And if you haven't yet unlocked your first pull-up, there's a video for that as well. But if you've got those baselines cleared, then let's get into the overall program. Now, first and foremost, this program utilizes a four day per week sort of split. So you've got two days for pushing and two days for pulling, two, two days for pulling. This leaves a few days for, for legs or for other types of training or just extra recovery if you really wanna go far with your pushing and your pulling. And uh, we want to utilize one primary exercise per movement category. Less is more. This is really important with this. We re really want to have an essentialist mindset where what I mean by movement category would be push and pull. Right? We have one main push movement and one main pulling movement. We might also add on one to even two, in some cases, supplementary exercises for filling in some small gaps, but mainly for working on just movement patterns that we don't get to work on when we're doing this main movement of ours. So. As for the progression system we'll be using, we'll be using something called the Russian method, really cool system where you really focus on large increases in weight more rarely, as opposed to doing small increases in weight often. I'll dive deeper into this further on, but great system for avoiding plateaus and to making sure we can progressively overload. Now, for the push exercises, right, there are a bunch of exercises we can choose, but given that we have a calisthenics focus and we really want to take our strength to the upper functional limit, the main movement I'd recommend is either doing weighted dips or overhead press. And here you might be a bit sort of conflicted about what to choose. And it depends a bit, right? It depends if you have particular skill goals or if you have particular weak areas you want to work on. For example, if you want to, if you really want to achieve the handstand push up, that's like your pinnacle of like the one skill you're chasing right now, then the overhead press would be a better choice for your main pushing movement, simply because it more closely mirrors the handstand push up movements, right? And you get to work more of your anterior deltoids, you get to work more of your shoulders and your like upper chest, as opposed to working more of your, your lower chest with the dips and, and your, your triceps, that type of thing. And in addition to this main movement, you also have a supplementary exercise that you can add in there or even as much as two. But you know, big thing I want to say for this entire entire program is that our main focus is the main movements, right? That's why it's called the main movement. So we really want to be careful with adding too much junk volume, adding too many exercises that aren't really going to do much for our overall strength, strength, strength performance and strength gains. So for the supplementary exercise, what I'd recommend is that if you go for weighted dips, you do the opposite as a supplementary exercise. So if you do weighted dips as your main movement, you do overhead pressing for your supplementary movement. And conversely, if you do overhead pressing as your main movement, you do weighted dips for your supplementary exercise. 
And really important, this is going to be light. It's not supposed to be something where you really push yourself to the limit. A big component with like supplementary exercises is that you want to use it to just train different movement patterns to like have your body like slow and controlled work on what other movement patterns, simply other exercises. You don't want to overload this. It's not supposed to be something useful necessarily, like max strength gains. It's just supposed to be a nice addition to fill in the gaps. You're not filling with your main movement. And, you know, an alternative to doing the same supplementary exercise on both sessions because you'll have two push days a week right and i'd recommend like the main movement is the main movement if it's weighted dips then for however long you want to keep up this program for whether it's like a three month cycle or like a six month block or whatever it is i'd recommend that you do the same movement same main main movement on on all push and respectively pull days when we get to that before the supplementary exercises you could do a sort of session a session b so first up in the week for example if you're doing weighted pull-ups if you're doing weighted dips, pardon my language, as your main movement, then for the uh, supplementary exercises, maybe on the first day you want to do light overhead pressing, but then later on, let's say on the on Thursday when we get to the second session, you might want to do some pronated push-ups or some inclined dumbbell bench press or some cable flies for that you know mind muscle connection with your chest. Lots of options here, but. I'd recommend at least getting in, like covering your bases. So like if you do your weighted dips as your main movement, I'd recommend getting an overhead press at least some place here. If you're really not a fan of overhead press, maybe you want to do some inclined dumbbell bench press to sort of hit that upper chest that like a, and get the shoulders more involved as well. And then if you want to do like this sort of session A, session B style, maybe for the second second day you work on like your pronated push-ups and um or perhaps your cable flies if you're really fan of that mind muscle connection but the biggest thing here isn't really to like grow any size or hypertrophy right like that isn't the goal of this program at all the goal of this program is to build as much strength as possible right and this is this is just really important to hammer home right you want to make sure that the supplementary exercise or exercises do not hinder your strength gains by hindering you know the max performance you have on your main movement the biggest thing with this program is to ensure that you're well recovered, well rested and well ready to just fire on all cylinders for those main movements you're doing when it, when it comes to both push and pull. So be clear about your goals like strength versus hypertrophy. If you want purely strength, make sure you maximize the effectiveness you get from your main movement. If you want a mix of strength and hypertrophy, you'll have to tweak up the rep and set ranges we'll go over later on because this is purely for strength, this program here. And if you're in in this uh, in this game so to speak if you're in the gym for for hypertrophy purposes well this program is not really going to be valid pretty much at all because we'll be applying systems and progression methods that really lend themselves well to strength gains not primarily to hypertrophy so for the poor side of things exercise selection let's go for the main movement here it's a pretty easy choice it's weighted pull-ups the only thing you really have to decide upon is whether you want to do weighted pull-ups or weighted chin-ups again it depends on sort of your skill goals or your weak areas, whatever have you. If you want to like fill in your weak areas, you can do that. But it's probably for most people more exciting to be like, no, it depends on what you want to reach like strength like skill wise in the long run. So I'd say weighted chin ups are better for one on pull up if you want to get to that. However, though, like weighted pull ups do generally provide a greater transfer to other pulling skills especially like the conventional like muscle ups, front levers when you have a pronated grip, right? And also to climbing, which is quite interesting, right? Because you're on the wall, like pronated is, except for like underclings, which you have every now and then, it's difficult to get supinated on the wall. Like it's not really something that occurs at least a lot of the time. Like sometimes you have weird funky roots, but I'm getting ahead of myself. You use usually climbing in a pronated position or a pronated style. So supplementary exercise though. Here I'd recommend just sticking to body weight rows so you get some like horizontal pulling in there. And usually when I train, I tend to do these on like both days because I'm just, just a fan of getting that horizontal pulling in. Again, body weight, you see like intensity on these supplementary exercises across the board should be dropped significantly. Body weight rows are pretty, pretty darn all right. Could you add weight to it? Sure, fair enough. There's absolutely room for adding some more load. You don't need to get, go completely bare bones and body weight. But honestly, they work well. So there's no no real issue here. But you can similar you can do a similar thing to with the pushing. You can do a session A, session B type type thing. Main movement, same for day one and day two on the pull front, but you can have different supplementary exercise selections. But still, I'd recommend that you have some body weight rows in there because it's nice to get that horizontal pulling to sort of balance it out and like for your body to train the horizontal pulling pattern as well. And 
if you absolutely want to do something else, you, ha you have a few options. You have the perfect pull-up, you have the arch of active hang, whether you want to work on your like straight arm retraction or, or bent arm sort of retraction and uh, scapular work. Then you have one arm hangs, a bunch of different options there. Again, like comment down below if you guys want to, to see a video of me detailing a bunch of accessory movements and the pros and cons of each. But um, but yeah, bodyweight rows are sort of a must, at least in my opinion. Like, don't have to be bodyweight rows. You could do barbell rows as well. Just make sure you don't go too heavy on the load. A similar thing here, we don't want to hinder our max performance on the main, main movement, which is the weight to pull-ups or the weight to chin-ups. So again, yeah, be clear about your goals. If you're in it for strength, brilliant. You, you can follow this plan to a T. If you want more hypertrophy, you'll have to tweak things up. And like, if hypertrophy is your main like bread and butter, your, your primary goal, then, well, this video isn't really ideal, is it? So, tying all of these things together. First and foremost, the order is quite important. We want to do push before we do pull in the weekly program. And that is for the simple reason that you want fresh lats when you're doing your pushing movements. Because your lats in your overhead pressing, and even to a certain degree on other, on other pushing movements as well, is your base of support. So if your lats, if you've, if you've switched this order around, for example, and you do your pull, you put your first pull day on Monday and then you come to Tuesday and you're supposed to do a push session and then your lats are tired because you just did pull yesterday. Then you'll have, you know, harder time, to put it lightly, to, to lift as much as you usually do on, on push days because your base of support, your like base standard, standard, standard position won't be as strong as it would if you were fresh in, in, in your lats. So important to keep this in mind. And this is just, you know, simple, simple thing to do, right? We change our push and pull. So we have push before we do pull. And when it comes to, you know, our individual sessions, quite simple stuff there as well. We want to do our main movement before our sup supplementary movement. Mind blowing. Absolutely. I know. It's just, you want to focus on the main, mo main movements. Obviously, that's what goes first. But with that said, we do want to warm up. And the entire point of warming up, I think like this is something that gets a bit lost in translation, it seems like. But the entire point of warming up is you want to elevate your heart rate. And I noticed the sessions I've just been moving around a bit and sort of like pump, like just, you know, moving the weights around as a warm up compared to the times I've just like gotten my heart rate up. It's actually quite a significant difference, especially when I'm doing like heavy, heavy sessions. So how can you get your heart rate up? Well, just jumping jacks, body weight squats, jogging in place or doing like higher repetition body weight pull-ups, rows, push-ups and dips, whatever have you. Just uh, just get your heart rate elevated, do some more sort of endurance sort of exercises. You don't have to start running because, you know, it doesn't really transfer over well to, to doing heavy lifts later on. Don't start like going on a 20-minute jog or something, but just like a few jumping jacks and body weight squats, you know, some body weight pull-ups and dips just to get, get the blood flowing and you're pretty all right sorted. So... And you'd also want to do like a bit of a warm up for your, like your particular set. So like one or two weight increments, depending on, on what weight you'll be using for the session. This is quite individual, so I'll leave that up to you. And when it comes to the number of sets and reps you'll be doing for your main movement, remember that we want to be following the Russian method. And so for this, what I really like to do, what I've found a lot of success with, is doing three to five sets of three to five reps for your main movement. So... There is room for adjustment, obviously, for this. Like if you want to have, for example, four to six reps instead of three to five, or you want to do two to four reps. But I just personally like three to five uh, by three to five. And it's also one of those things where. Oh, sorry. It's also one of those things where if your main pursuit is strength, then why not just go for this program? And then you'll have three to five by three. Like unless you're catering for other things then I'd say three to five sets by three to five reps is a pretty good sweet spot. And how this actually looks like on a day-to-day -day or sort of training day to training day, um, day-by-day basis, is that your first session, you go into the gym and you do three sets of three repetitions or, for example, the weighted pull-ups if it's a pull day, right? And the next session after that, we want to think quite logically about it, right? Like when we're doing the Russian method, we want to build up gradually sets and reps. And it's not necessarily reasonable to go into the gym next like next session a couple of days after and expect that now you can do four repetitions per set that's not really reasonable because like doing extra reps in a in a single set is quite tough right if you think about it from like you zoom out a bit so what we want to do is quite nice and simple add on just another set of the same number of reps so you go back into the gym and you have now four sets of three reps and then after that you come back and you do another set of so five sets of three reps per set 
next time again after you of when you come back to the gym rather than now though going up to six sets of three reps seven to, like in, continuing that saga until you like until you get to like an infinite number of sets per per session what you want to do then once you can do five sets of three reps the next session you go into the gym you go back to three sets but this time four repetitions per set because at this point you've accumulated enough sets enough reps and you've trained yourself enough at this rep range enough for this load to the point where it's pretty reasonable to expect that now you can pump out an extra rep for those three sets. Then next time you go into the gym again, you do now four sets of four reps. Then you do five sets of four reps. And once you've built up to the five sets of four reps, then you go back down to three sets. But this time, another rep is introduced, right? So you do five repetitions per set. So three sets of five, then you do four sets of five. And then eventually you get to five sets of five repetitions. Once you have completed that workout, you are ready to go back to three by three, but this time with more load. So for example, a full 10 kilo increment. Now, sometimes you might need some additional sessions between five times five and three times three at a new load. For example, if you've done 30 kilogram pull-ups and you've been able to do five sets of five reps at 30 kilos extra for the pull-ups, going back to three by three at 40 kilos, you might just struggle a bit. And so in order to ease the transition a bit, what we could do is add in a few intermediate sessions where we do we go up to as much as six or even seven if you want to add like those two extra sessions six sets and then seven sets of five reps per set for the 30 kilos or or in addition to this you could do both like to have those four intermediate steps you then go to three sets but now of six reps at 30 kilos and then another session of four sets of six reps at 30 kilos and then you go up to, well, then you go to three by three at the new weight of 40 kilos. This is possible. And sometimes it's like you, you feel like it, it's nice to just add in a bit more, bit more volume at, at the old weight before you drop to, the, to, to three by three at the new weight. But alternatively to this, you could just add a smaller weight increment. We'll talk more about this later on. But obviously, you can't keep on adding 10 kilos indefinitely because, I mean, eventually you just be able to lift like what cars from a dip belt hanging below you, right? It wouldn't be humanly feasible. But it is an option to be aware of that if you want to stick to a larger weight increment and you think you you might just get there, maybe you want to add in a few intermediate sessions rather than dropping the weight increment. It is nice to be aware of. All right, so now for the number of sets and reps you have on your supplementary movement. Here I don't think it's that important. I mean, if you want to do the Russian method, you can. It's an option. You can stick to two to three or let's say two to four sets or five to seven reps. But I would go way lighter in load. I mean, as I've written here, reps in reserve greater than three or four. And the entire point with your supplementary movement is that you want to have it be a supplementary part to your training. You want to have it build up under the main movements, right? So here it's like a bit of a personal preference for me, though. I like to go higher rep and lighter load. Can you tweak it up? Sure. Is it wise? Depends. Depends what type of programming you go for. But it's not too important really with Russian method or anything else. The way I like to see it, you have your main movement and that is really important that you progress with from week to week and you push yourself. But then with your supplementary movements, it's really for me like it's not too important if you have any progression systems, although that might sound a bit strange. The priority is, as I said, the main movement. And here you just want to fill in some slight gaps. So whatever exercises you are doing, you want to be doing slow and controlled reps of a lighter intensity. You don't need a strict progression system. You can sort of wing it. Should it be you just like standing there with a barbell, like no weights, the weights on it and just like, you know, jacking it up and down? No, but it shouldn't be something where you're just like maxing out and like you cannot like physically comprehend the idea of doing another set after the ones you have planned for the session. Right. This should be pretty light work and you should instead f focus on like having slow and controlled reps of a lighter intensity. So yeah, the entire idea, as I've stated a few times already, work on the movement pattern. You want to work on the movement pattern and engage the muscles you aren't engaging, um, you know, necessarily engaging when you're doing your main movements. Then when it comes to rest times, this is a thing people tend to discuss a lot, but it's actually quite simple. I like to think about it as like you do minimum three minutes. There's less than three minutes. It's like it's quite darn short if you want to do strength training, right? Granted, between your accessory lifts, like between the supplementary exercise sets, you can get away with two to three minutes. You can. But for the strength work, minimum three minutes. Absolutely. 
and it can be as much as five or even six minutes. I mean, people even go like, I've heard people go to like six, seven minutes, but like, obviously you get to a point where like, if you're completely like just rested up again, you need to do a new warm up before you go into your training or like your next set, which is kind of pointless. But I'd say it can be as much as five or six minutes. The big thing to keep in mind though, the important thing is that you're physically and mentally ready for another set when you get back up on the bar. If you make, if you make sure that this is true for your strength training set, you're pretty solid. Whether it's three and a half minutes rest or five and a half minutes rest, doesn't really matter. And yeah, simply feeling fatigue, this is an important point as well. I'm going to try to not go too deep into this because I guess it's a topic for another video. But simply feeling fatigued does not equate to the best strength gains. Let me give you an example with some nice numbers. Let's say you go into the gym and you're about to lift 80 kilos in the overhead press for four sets of five reps. Not me, because my overhead press is not <laughs> by far not there yet. But let's say that's what you're going in to do. Now, if you're going in to do that 80, 80 by for five reps, four sets. If you have small rest times, maybe you're able to hit the first set five reps, then you're able to hit three reps, sorry, four reps, then three reps, and then maybe three or maybe even as bad as two if you really skip the rest times because you're just so eager to get back to the bar. But if you are to perform it in this fashion, right, so you get, what would it be, five, four, three, two, let's say we add those up. If you are to get in just those 14 repetitions in total, right, in the course of that workout, that would equate to less strength gain than if you were to be able to do five, six minutes rest between each set. So you can do five, 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 four, or even a full deck of cards, so to speak, a full set of fives across the board. And this is, this goes for a lot of different sort of programming options as well, right? Like if you were to go into the gym and you're feeling quite tired, so you're not able to do those 80 kilos for five reps, maybe you do 75 kilo for five reps, but it feels even more tiring and you're even more fatigued after those sets right there than if you were to do the 80 kilos for five reps and a good couple of sets of that. Even if it feels more fatiguing, you're building less strength because your body has a certain strength thre threshold. Does this mean that if you feel a bit tired, you should just skip the gym entirely? Not necessarily, most times no. Right, like, do you want to have times where we are outside of the gym and not not training and taking some active rest? Absolutely, but it's not the case that you just you feel it out and you're like, oh, okay, I can't pull for eighty today. I can only pull seventy or seventy five. I'm just going to sit at home because you need to like stimulate strength at least to the extent that you can. Because sometimes you know just certain factors occur that we cannot control. You're stressed. You have a bunch of factors that you know stress at work. You're sleeping poorly. Your diet's a bit shit. All of these things that influence how we perform and how we feel in the in the training room. But when you are there and you feel that you cannot really pull 80, but you can only, let's say, pull 75, you do get less strength gain from that. And this is why it's important to rest in all its forms, right? Like both from day to day and, you know, from, from session to, from set to set. And this is, you know, part of why like the rest times are important because if you, if you did, if it just feels, sorry, if it just feels heavy, it doesn't mean you're actually becoming stronger. At least not as much as you could be if you properly rested and then exerted yourself to the max. So, as for deloads, deloads are really important to avoid plateaus and let your body rest. And deloads, deloads is you simply doing a lighter week of training. Either a lighter week or in the case of like proper rest weeks, like kind of deload, I suppose, is that you do no training. So you just sit on the couch or maybe you do some stretching, maybe you do some foam rolling, foam rolling maybe you do some lighter lighter forms of movements, you go for some walks, maybe some lighter jogs, but you're outside of the, like you're not doing any training, right? Like no training would be rest week. If you're doing lighter forms of it, it would be deload week. And deloads are really important to do about every four to eight weeks. Does it have to be specifically every four to eight weeks? No, I can, you know, the range might vary from person to person, but the importance of deloads is that you let your body sort of catch up with the amount of stimulus you've put it through over the last couple of weeks and months. So if you don't have these, like if you, if you just completely avoid deloads and you say, ah, can't be bothered to take a week off, you'll struggle to maintain, maintain progress simply because it's nice for that. Like it is a way to, to hold yourself, to let your body take in the recent stimulus so that you avoid plateauing, right? So it's, in the long run, it's really important to do deloads, right? And sometimes in the short term, it feels a bit like a waste of time because oh, I just want to be hitting the gym and really just like upping my strength. But trust me, the deloads are a great tool in your arsenal to make sure that you are steadily progressing. Now, 
with every four to eight weeks, even if you are to use that range, because I think it's generally pretty all right range to use. How would you decide if it's four weeks or eight weeks or five or six? Well, the way I like to think about it is that you have a bunch of factors to influence this, right? So sleep, if you're sleeping really well, you can afford to take deloads less often. If you're sleeping really unwell, if you're sleeping really poorly, you need to take deloads more often. Similarly with nutrition, good nutrition equals fewer deloads in the course of a year, right? Like you can deload less often, whereas if you eat really poorly, then you'd have to deload more often. I'd say sleep is by far more important than nutrition, but it still has an impact, right? Then for training intensity, if you're training incredibly intensely, balls to the wall, which are just absolutely drained, then you need to do a deload more often than if you were to train at a lighter intensity level. And energy levels, sort of similar to training levels, in a sense, they influence each other, right? But this would be that if you're really tired in and out of the gym, you'd need to deload more often. Whereas if you have really high energy levels, then you're able to take a deload less often. But the, all of these factors influence each other's, like, in, influence each other, and you have different things like outside of these things that also contribute. For example, if you are really stressed at work or with, with a bunch of exams currently in school or whatever have you, then that is going to affect how often you'd need to deload and how hard you can push yourself in the gym. Everything is sort of tied together in this, right? So when it comes to injury prevention, this is sort of related to deloads as well. But specifically now talking a bit about rep ranges. If you feel like three to five reps is too heavy, either on your joints or it's just it's not sustainable for you to do that low of a rep range. You just you cannot keep up the pace, right? Then four to six or even five to seven reps is a doable strategy. It can work. It can absolutely work. But I still would recommend three to five reps for most people. At least as long as you're able to keep your ego in check and do proper reps, right? Where it becomes a problem is when you go into the three to five reps, your ego lifting, you cannot lift it properly. There are no proper reps there because like you don't get your chin properly over the bar, for example, for the pulls, right? All of these things. Because at that point, you're just heading for an injury, right? You're not really stimulating the best sort of strength gains. And even if you are like the strength, even if the strength stimulus would be pretty darn good, if you get injured, what's the point? Because then you have to be out of the gym for, for weeks or months on end, right? So not very wise from a sort of a strength gains perspective. And yeah, also make sure to rest properly between sets. So rest times. Make sure, as I said earlier on the previous slide, make sure that these things are proper. Because if, you, if you're not able to like perform adequately during your sets, again, suboptimal strength gains. You also want to perform, you also want to rest well between your workouts. So not just between your sets, but then between your full workouts, you want to be resting well. And that means sleep. Sleep is so important. It's probably the number one thing you can do well in order to, to make sure your performance in the gym keeps, keeps progressing. And last but not least, you also want to make sure that you rest from month to month-ish, right? It's not necessarily month to month, but like between between training blocks or training periods, right? So that you deload. If you can make sure you do these things, you have good rest times, you have adequate sleep, right? And you do deloads every, let's say, four to eight weeks, as I spoke about earlier, depending on how you eat, how you sleep, how you train, how hard, how hard you train and what type of energy levels you have. As long as these things are met, then you're up for, for pretty good sort of injury prevention and for pretty good progress and pretty steady progress as well. So tying it all together now with an example workout program. As you'll see with this, there's room for skill work, there's room for legs and there's grip work, all types of different styles of training. Just make sure that if you really want to, pro want to prioritize strength, that you don't compromise the following sort of blueprint to just program, right? And as it looks right now, pushing before pulling, right? You start off, let's say on a Monday with push, you do a warm up, then you have your three to five sets of, for example, dips, weighted dips. Then you do two, three, two to three sets of a supplementary movement, possibly even of a second supplementary movement as well. But I recommend that you don't overdo it. Don't do junk volume, I have to tell you, right? And then Tuesday, day after you do a pull, pull session. So similar sort of style. Warm up, three to five sets of the weighted pull ups, two to three sets of a supplementary movement or even another supplementary movement for a few sets. But just make sure, for the love of God, like junk volume, keep it down. Then you have a re complete rest day on Wednesday. Then Thursday, similar push session. Friday, similar pull session. And then you have Saturday, Sunday off. So another thing I sort of wanted to touch briefly upon because I've had a few questions about this. What if you want to combine strength training with 
something else. Something else, for example, being skill training. Well, I'd recommend that you do skill training before strength training, but note that this has the potential to negatively impact your strength training. Good to be aware of. For example, for the one-arm pull-up, right? One-arm pull-up training is quite darn taxing. So it will have an effect if you do one-arm pull-up training, at least depending on what type of exercises you do, before you do your weighted pull-ups. So this is very important to be aware of. And then if you want to combine strength training with endurance training, I'd recommend that you do your endurance training after the strength training. But this also has the potential to lead to like junk volume, right, which hinders your max strength gains. If you do sets upon sets upon sets of max body weight pull-ups, then obviously that's going to carry over and like your body's going to feel it. You're going to build up systemic fatigue, right? The only question is how much are you building up and does it interfere with your, uh, with your, with your strength training, right? So for both of these, they require more attention if they are to be properly addressed. So let me know if you want to see a video about combining skills and strength training or endurance and strength training, and I'll be happy to make that as well. Before now, you know, a few key points about them, but if I are to if I am to address them any any sort of specifically, I'd have to have to make a dedicated video for them. Now, setting some expectations for pro progress. It's nice to have a bit of a blueprint now, have a bit of a map, like an idea of where we're going, like how the program looks, like what you do in terms of setting all of this up. But I feel like this is a nice component to add in as well if you want to do it properly. So for the sort of expectations you might have around this program, it's nice to be aware of that each sort of weight increment they will be doing, right? Each sort of little cycle will last for about two to two and a half months. Sure, maybe you can do them a bit faster in the start, maybe it's one and a half months or something. But two to two and a half months includes all training weeks. It includes one to two deloid or rest weeks during this period, because you need to have those just every four to eight weeks, depending on your performance. And if you notice that shit's just hitting the fan, you really need to just take some rest. Take some rest. You can't always control that, right? And it also includes one to two sessions where you build up back to your working weight after you've had a deload week. So with this, two to two and a half months per, per, per weight increment, it doesn't seem like you'll get many weight increments per year. And that's right, you don't. But when you have weight increments, you have proper weight increments, right? So in the course of, let's say, six months, you'll be able to put on significant amount of weight on, on like your working sets and reps to where you are currently, right? So stick with it and, and you'll see great, great results. Another thing to be aware of is that the weight increments will be smaller over time, right? The more cycles, the more weight increments you go through, the smaller the weight increments will be. And this makes sense. You can't keep adding 10 kilos indefinitely. That'd be wild. So more than likely, you'll have something like this. Maybe the first one, two, perhaps even three. Depends de Depends on like your genetic sort of baseline for a particular sort of movement pattern as well. And like a particular sort of movement category. If you're a really strong like pushing athlete or a really strong pulling athlete, you might get away with doing a free, like a couple of jumps at 10 kilos and a couple of jumps at 7.5. It depends. But this is pretty much how it how it go, right? Like you like once you cannot do ten kilo jumps anymore, you'd go down to seven point five. Or if, if you're using kettlebells, you know eight kilos is typically a nice sort of number to mix uh, to mix different kettlebells so that you get that eight kilo increment. Then five kilos, right, etc. At least it's like this if you stick to the same rep and set ranges. It is possible to keep on doing, like it is possible, I guess, to keep on doing bigger jumps and weight like ten kilos for quite some time if you tweak up the rep and set ranges, but that does in turn change up how many months you're spending on that weight increment. So however however you tweak it, you cannot keep on progressing with 10 kilos every two to two and a half months. And um, it's also important to know that like if you're getting stuck, there are a few things to look out for, right? Like you likely have too much junk volume in your program. That's often the case for people. Because people often want to have, like, and myself included, like, you want to have everything. You want to train a bit of this, train a bit of that. But you need to have a bit of an essentialist mindset, essentialist mindset going into this, right? You just, you need to be able to focus on the things that are really important. So, you know, it's, it's just how it works, right? This program requires you to prioritize your main push and pull it above all else. So if you have a lot of junk volume, that is going to hold you back. An alternative to being stuck because you have too much junk volume is that you rest too little or you have too sparse deload weeks each season, right? If you need to deload, you need to deload. That's just how it is. Your body can't just be put on pause and be like, no, no, we'll just do two weeks of raw strength training when you're really fatigued and you need to take some time off, right? One week off is nothing compared to like running into an injury and having to take months off. 
or like to just plateauing completely and seeing no strength gains, running into a wall, sort of like becoming angry and stressed about all of this, just take your deload when you need to deload. Listen to your body. It's it's pretty important, to be honest. And um, if you haven't understood from the video, it's pretty important, guys. And uh, yeah, when it comes to patience and consistency, what you want to what you want to focus on is that you want to be in it for the long run, right? If you make one weight increment, sure, great, but it's not really that outstanding, right? What you want to do is you want to be in it for the long long run in the sense that you don't rush into an injury and you don't fall off the bandwagon. What does this mean? Well, in terms of not falling off the bandwagon, you want to have consistency, right? You want to put in the work. Similarly, you don't want to rush into an injury, right? You want to pace yourself and not just run in, like avoid running into an injury, but you want to avoid junk volume because junk volume is going to prevent you from realizing the greatest strength gains. As long as you're able to do these two things, you're able to stay consistent and you're able to pace yourself, you're able to do the work, but not do so much work that you run into problems, then you have a lot of great uh, great weight increments ahead of you, right? And if you stick with this for a long time, this is where you make the most progress. I want to sort of include this quote here of um, Lao Tzu, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, hopefully. And that is that a journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step, right? And the big thing here is just one step at a time. Right now, it seems like doing a little weight increment or going from three by three to four by three and all of these little things seems like just a tiny change, right? And that's how it will be. Like in the short term, things feel like they're going incredibly slowly. But when you zoom out, like in a year or in two years, you'll look back and realize that you've made an incredible amount of progress from when you began. So just keep your head down, so to speak, or like, you know, focus on the on the target, right? Or like just stick with it, stick with the process. Trust in the process, make sure that you're staying consistent, but that you're also pacing yourself, right? And you'll see great results from this program. Lastly, I wanted to let you know once again that, you know, don't forget to join the free community. If you want to join a group of passionate, like-minded athletes that want to see each other succeed, you want to take your strength levels to the next to, to, to the next level, to, to the next era, and you want to really just level up and unlock skills, just build great connections with other people, feel free to join the community, top link in the description down below. And also, if you're interested in knowing how I managed to achieve a close to 200% weighted pull-up, so how I managed to add 94.37, to be exact, percent of my body weight on a pull-up, right? Like, as you guys see here, 60 kilos is 66, 67 for the weighted pull-up. If you want to see like a little extra element I used in my pull training, consider watching this video right here. But without further ado, thanks for watching. Goodbye.